My name is Tagal Gavriot uh, from Ethiopian Development Research uh, Institute. Uh, the topic uh, I'm presenting today is policies promoting climate smart agriculture practice and gender differentiated nutrition outcome. This study would have two objectives. One is to look at the effect of climate smart agriculture practices and their effect on nutritional outcome by disaggregating between male and female-headed household. And the second is to look at the effect of climate and uh, socioeconomic factors, socioeconomic factors that influence adoption decision. So we consider here, for, from the climate smart agriculture practice, we consider three choice variables. One is the crop diversification, which is constructed using the crop diversification index. And the second is soil and water conservation. And the third is uh, modern input use. On the study area, uh, our empirical assessment uses a recent panel data set that combines uh, household socioeconomic data with georeference data on historical temperature and rainfall, as well as farm level characteristics. And it was collected in 2016 and 17 during uh, a cropping season. So in this study, two uh, household level nutritional indicators were used. One is the Dietary Diversity Index, which is constructed using the Simpson uh, Index of Food Diversity. And the second is the Per Adult Equivalent in Nutrient Consumption. Particularly, we were interested in looking at the difference in protein and calorie intake across the female and male-headed households. Looking at the, some of the uh, summary statistics that we get from the study, it's that uh, the average per capita calorie consumption is about 2,700 kilocalorie, which is uh, higher than the average daily uh, calorie requirement set by the Ethiopian government. And looking on the dietary diversity, we got the Simpson index value of 0 0.70, indicating that farm households are exhibiting higher diversity across the two uh, periods. Here is the choice variable. Analysis of the three climate smart agriculture practice led to eight combinations where farmers are able to choose. However, in our case, the result indicated that at household level, we didn't observe no adoption of practices. So we end up with seven uh, combination of practices so the interesting results that we see here is there is a substantial difference in the uh, adoption of different combination of practices. So we have, for instance, 44% adopts the three practices. However, adoption of the three practices have declined from 47% uh, in 2016 to 41% uh, in 2017. And there is also a high or significant difference between male-headed and female headed households. On the case of the, our empirical strategy, in order to avoid self-selection self bias, our study used what you call the endogenous switching regression system that involves two, two uh, stage estimation approach. In the first stage, we applied what you call the multivariate profit model in order to look the factors that influ influence farmers' choice for adoption. And the second step, we try to look at the uh, impact of the different combination of uh, climate smart agricultural practice on household nutrition by disaggregating between male and female headed households. So basically what we did was to look at the adoption effect of climate smart agricultural practice on the adopter, basically by looking at the expected nutritional outcome of adopting more number of practices against or the counterfactual of adopting of fewer number of practices. When looking at the gender gap, we try to address from two points. One is from the difference in compositional effect, and the other is from the dif difference in technological effect. So we try to control the household and farm level characteristics, basically, in order to deal with unobserved heterogeneity and possible endogeneity bias. The interest is basically we do observe climate and social capital variables also in choice of adoption of climate smart agricultural practice. 
Our interest is basically to look on the adoption effect of combination of different practice on household nutrition, basically on uh, gender differentiated household decision. So the top three uh, from A to C uh, compares the national outcome of adopting uh, combination of two practices against one, and the bottom three from DTF compares the national outcome of adopting three practice against two practice. So as you can see, the result indicates that adoption of more uh, number of combination practice provides higher Simpson index as compared to adoption of practice in isolation or practice adopting fewer number of practice. As you can see from uh, the first three uh, row, while adopting the uh, crop diversification and soil wa and water conservation provides an effect of 0.075 Simpson index, but this Simpson index rises to 0 0.166 when households adopted the three combination of practice. This is basically the adoption effect on uh, calorie consumption. Similar to the previous slide, we observed that adoption of uh, more number of proxies provide high calorie consumption than adoption of small number of practice. But when you look at the bottom uh, rows from DTF, we couldn't find statistical evidence on the difference between the nutritional outcome of adopting three practices against the partial adoption, or what you call the two practices. The same results already observed in protein consumption. Protein consumption is higher when practices are adopted jointly against when practices are adopted in isolation. The point of interest here is also the gender gap. So we lock the gender gap from the difference in household composition, which we call it the composition effect, and the difference in technology adoption, which we call it uh, the gender gap. So from, from the uh, first uh, combination of, uh, from the first three combinations, you can see that if female-headed households are the same response uh, returns as male-headed households, female-headed households' dietary diversity would have increased from 0 0.629 0 0.685, which is about 9%, or from 6, 0 0.63 to 671, which is about 5%, and also it might increase uh, from 0 0.64 to 0 0.692. On the other hand, if female-headed households had the same returns as male-headed household characteristics, then the uh, food diversity increase, dietary index would have been increased from 0 0.685 to 0 0.723. So I will not go to in detail to each of uh, the uh, results, but the summary results that we have observed for the primary work is that we found household nutrition outcome differential between female and male-headed households due to uh, composition effect when you call composition effect, that's the difference in household composition. It might be household characteristics, it might be difference to access to resource, it might be difference to managerial skills. And the other is the difference in response to those resources, which we call is the technology effect. So in general, the results suggest that elimination of gender differential in access to resource would not lead to equality in nutrition security status unless accompanied by those that improve returns to those resources. Thank you. I think we have some uh, time for questions, comments and questions. So please, if you have any comments or questions on the presentations, the floor is open. Vincent, um, you said that the NAADS is a national program and it's for 25 years, or it's been in existence for 25 years. My, my issue is how did you identify participants and non-participants if this is a national program? Okay. And um, Tagel, I, I saw a table that showed that um, the lower the number of food groups on average that is consumed, the higher the, is it the calorie intake. 
there was a table that I saw food groups, and I was trying to look at the number of food groups that are consumed, and then the um, amount of calories that it, it infers. And it looks like I saw the lower it is, the higher the calorie. Maybe you want to throw a little light. Maybe I got confused. Um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jacob. Um, so the <laughs> several questions. Um, my brother who presented first, uh, I also would love to have an understanding of the um, intervention, this FISP, because then um, I had a similar question to the second presenter in terms of how do you choose your control if it is a national program, so thank, thanks to him. So if you could also just clarify how the program is implemented and then uh, uh, explain how you chose your controls, because um, I think um, I, I did not um, understand fully. And, and what is in the package? So when we say farmer um, input support program, what is in the package? The reason I ask is, um, should I be surprised that it improved crops, diversity, you know? But, but I cannot ask the second question if I don't understand how the program is designed and how it is implemented. Just another, um, um, just another question on that. So you, you measure um, uh, three outcomes. Do you want to think about you know, the whole discussion of multiple hypothesis testing and how you want to adjust for that? Yeah? Um, um, and, and, and the second presenter, I, I just wanted to know if, um, I, I might have missed it, but are you controlling for any confounders or you have just run uh, the input and outcome, output variables. Thank you very much. Thank you, hi. I'm Ellen McCullough from the University of Georgia. Um, I thought all of you did an interesting job of identifying the program effects uh, that you were trying to, to measure. Um, what I was curious about was mechanisms, because some of these effects didn't seem totally straightforward that you would link these types of outcomes to these types of programs. So I'd love to hear all of you reflect a little bit on the mechanisms for how you think these effects were, were um, achieved? Um, I think I captured two questions here from our colleague. The first was the intervention and how the controls selected. And I think on the intervention, I'll answer it uh, with the second question, which is uh, what is the package? Because the intervention is a package, actually. The fertilizer input support program. Uh, involves giving farmers about 200 kgs of fertilizer. And initially, they were also, uh, they used to be given about 10 kgs of improved maize seed. But now, uh, since 2010, 2011, uh, some crops have been added to the package. Uh, wheat, uh, sorghum, rice, I think, those are the two I can remember. So that's the package. Now, how was the control chosen? The data we used is the national representative data. We didn't deliberately choose the control. This is the data which was randomly corrected. But then to estimate the treatment effects, what we did was to create counterfactuals from the non-beneficiaries. And we did this by using two matching algorithms. The first one, is the nearest neighbor matching algorithm. And for the nearest neighbor, what it is is we calculate the propensity scores of each participating unit in that sample. And then we get only those whose propensity scores are near to the beneficiary's propensity score and compare the two. This ensures that we equate, because the propensity score is a condition probability of being in the program. So we are controlling for the confounding factors. For the kernel matching, what we do is we just get the average of the control units or control beneficiary households, the average propensity score from that, and those are only the beneficiary units which are found within the common support region. And let me explain a little bit about the common support region. What usually happens is that 
outliers from the control units and also from the beneficiaries are removed from the analysis. So only those which are found which can be comparable are the ones used. So that's the issue of uh, getting our control. And from there, you can estimate your average treatment effects. Okay, thank you very much for explaining the uh, matching mechanisms. Um, so what I was asking is, in the database that you're using, so do you have a question if one participated and one did not participate? So, and, 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 and so if it is yes, um, assuming um, I, we implement a program here, and, and, and he's my twin brother, but he did not receive, so I could assume that the propensity score could be very close, yeah, because we live in the same community, maybe the conditions are similar. But would you expect, for example, spillover effects? Because we're in the same village, we are, we are doing the same thing. Because when you are choosing for you to assign me as treated, him as not treated, you are using this variable to say, did you participate in the FISP or not? So at that level, do you think there could be um, um, spillover effect? Do you think you would start to think about economy-wide effects or community-wide effects or something like that? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I think let, let me start from the second uh, question, whether we are controlling for the uh, compounding factors. As I have mentioned in my presentation, we control uh, the household and farm characteristics in order to deal uh, unobserved heterogeneity and possible uh, uh, selection beds. Basically, we know that adoption of climate smart agricultural practice may not be random. Instead, farmers uh, may make a decision based on information that is not available to the researcher, to us. So in that case, this information might influence the adoption in the outcome equation, which leads basically to self-selection beds. So in our case, to deal with those self-selection bears, we use endogenous switching approach that involves two-stage estimation approach. So I think from our side, we try to control all uh, variables that influence the outcome and adoption equation. That's one. And second, it's that based to the uh, food diversity. As I mentioned, we used two household uh, nutritional indicators. One is the data diversity index. And the other is nutritional adequacy, basically calorie and protein consumption. So we didn't deal the basically across the food groups. What we did was we constructed a diversity, dietary diversity index, and we tried to look this diversity index and its uh, influence by adopting either more or fewer number of climate smart agricultural practices. That's what we did. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, similar, similar to uh, Elias. Access, access to extension services in NATS program is demand driven. Uh, farmers demand for services. Therefore, they make a choice whether to demand or to go for extension services or not. Uh, so we follow this then using uh, the LSMS data on, did you access extension services? Did you access uh, the NATS uh, program services? So, 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 so with, 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 with the yes or no is, is, is when we created uh, the, the participants and non-participants. And, and, and then we followed the, the, same, uh, the, same, the same analysis of, of, of counterfactuals. Um, so, all of you were presenting the effects of, say, an extension program, a climate smart agriculture program, on something like crop diversity, diet diversity. So these aren't things you, you might naturally think A would cause B. Uh, so while your focus has been on the identification of the treatment effect, uh, my question is how was this treatment effect achieved? So what were the do you have a sense about what the pathways were through which, for instance, the FIS program was affecting crop diversity? I think, uh, for instance, when looking at the adoption of climate smart agricultural practice and how it's linked also to nutritional outcome, I think we can, we can look multiple pathways. One, one potential pathway might be through 
increased consumption that might be facilitated through increased the quantity of on-farm food production, that's one. And then the second uh, puzzle it might be through increased income, which would be realized by increased uh, productivity and also high yielding uh, crop varieties. So in this case, there might be some uh, multiple potential pathways how adoption of climate smart agricultural practice, whether in combination or in isolation, would lead to achieving higher uh, diversity of food or food and nutrition security. Yeah, as for the study from from Zambia on the fertilizer support input policy, I mentioned towards the end that this is work in progress. We are trying to identify those pathways, but we have some some indications of probably what is happening, because we when we looked at the crop uh, diversity index, it was positive but insignificant. But when we looked at the uh, diversification of agricultural income, it was significant and positive. So what we are suspecting is that probably um, the program, though it's giving fertilizer and is concentrating on the maize, farmers are using the fertilizer on something else, but within the agricultural sector. So that's one of the pathways. But on the relationship between production diversity and also diversity, we couldn't find a direct link between the policy and also data diversity. So we want to go back and reanalyze and see whether that's through marketing or something else. Yeah. Okay. So just to follow up on that question, if it's true that the effects are primarily through something else rather than own consumption of the increased production, I'm curious about heterogeneity and whether there's a bigger effect, you know, estimating these average, once you think about mechanisms, the next question would be, are these effects larger if it's a market purchase that leads to diet diversity for the households that are closer to markets? And I'm curious about a next step of this that would look at heterogeneity, perhaps first by proximity to markets, uh, but then also other characteristics that would give people greater opportunity to use that mechanism of the diversification and agricultural uh, and access to, uh, to markets for purchase. Good morning, my name is Miriam Matita. I want to ask a question on the production diversity. Others have argued that uh, the computation has to, to reflect the food groups. I came in, I don't know for your study, is that the case? Because uh, you're talking of the mechanisms being weak. Uh, does it, uh, include or did it reflect the food groups when you were computing the production diversity? Thank you. Uh, as I have said, we use two national indicators. The uh, one is the data diversity index, which looks across different food groups. So in that case, we didn't go for a count measure of data diversity because it doesn't reflect the relative importance of each groups or the, the nutritional adequacy of each groups. What we did in our cases, we tried to construct the household data diversity index using Simpson index of food diversity, which gives us emphasis on the relative importance of each food group. And in case of uh, Simpson index, it reaches higher when food groups are distributed equally among the different food groups. So we tried to get uh, the best indicator of dietary diversity using the Simpson index of uh, dietary diversity. But when we consider, if you are able to consider, for instance, the count measure, in that case, you fail to look the importance of each group, the importance of each food group in terms of uh, nutritional adequacy. For in our case, then we have already considered the right indicator for of, uh, Simpson index. Yeah, we just to add on what you're saying, we considered the food groups. And actually, you know, the issue of food groups, we considered the 16 food groups, we considered the four 12, 12 food groups. And also, when we go back now, you know, we are going to consider the, is it the six women uh, diversity food groups? 
So we considered the foot cross. As for your comments, we'll take that into consideration. I think there were more like suggestions which you, yeah, thank you. Okay. So, uh, any, any more burning questions or comments? Okay. So, yeah, so, so thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, thanks uh, again to our presenters. Maybe we should give them another round of applause. Yes. So, so I think as my colleague mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, these projects, these presentations are part of a bigger project, uh, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we really appreciate the support. And uh, the, the project actually spans four uh, sort of disparate activities. One is what you call collaborative research, which is uh, where we bring together senior researchers from Africa and from around the globe to work together on, on these big issues. And the other is, of course, thematic research where we have our early career researchers um, who come together, to bring it together, the senior researchers for capacity building purposes. And then we have faculty research. So some of the presentations today and also from yesterday are done by faculty members in the ARC network universities, and especially the collaborative masters in agriculture and applied economics. Then, of course, we have uh, a thesis by students as well. That's the fourth track. So, so, we, so this is just a, a small part of the presentation because this is a much bigger project and with so many papers in the project. So again, I want to thank the presenters and, of course, all, all the participants for, for coming to this session. So, so thank you very much uh, for this. Yeah.